It's really good to have Pastor Boniface Samani here from Kenya. And uh, last time he was here, he got caught up in the COVID stuff. And uh, what was supposed to be, I think, a three-week trip was, what, three months, six months? It was a long time. And uh, he's going to give you an update here in a little bit. If you have not met him before, do that before you leave. Go up, shake his hand, and love on him. He is a man of God. And uh, I don't know. Uh, he moves in a reverence that's around him for the Lord. Just that way. And Gordon, that you, uh, Vanami, Reverend Gordon, um, whom many of you may or may not know, but clearly God knows because he was speaking a lot of things over in and through him. So um, anyway, we're going to do that. So I'm going to move through this, I don't know, maybe quickly. We'll see. You okay back there? Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. So how many got the ping and read it? Good. Some of you, some of you didn't. If you aren't getting that, let me know. And um, we'll get you on that list. Um, boy, this took a, some graphics are real easy in a given week. This one took me a long time because the issue is about armor that we try to put on that just doesn't fit right. And I needed to put it in a battlefield context. And I needed to show people who were frankly trying to put on stuff that just didn't wear. And because uh, we're in a time where the armor that you're wearing is going to be very critical. And what are you doing about it or not? Okay, so why are we even doing this? Well, we're in the ninth biblical month, and the ninth biblical month, I won't go into all the times and seasons of the Lord, just suffice, suffice to say it, it's in Scripture, so we align with it. Not in any kind of legalistic way, but we believe that God's put things in time because there's things he wants us to pay attention to. And the ninth tribe that's connected with that is the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin is quite... The tribe. I kind of like the picture of this guy looking like he's got a tattoo with the name Benjamin on him. Because out of that tribe comes King Saul, of course, Jonathan, his son, Mordecai, Esther, the Apostle Paul, and others. They are no nonsense, kind of get it done people. Okay? They are dangerous deliverers, they're cunning warriors, but the question is always just how they're aligned or with whom they're aligned. Okay? And a lot of that comes because when Benjamin was being born, first his mother called him Benoni, which means what? Son of my sorrow. It was frankly all about her. It's a very flesh orientation. But his father, not wanting him to go through life with that name, changed it to Benjamin, right? Which means what? Son of my right hand or power. And it's, so it's, it's, it's looking up away instead of from the flesh. It's about in the spirit. But that kind of eh, almost split personality sometimes kind of runs through the tribe. And frankly, through everyone here, <laughs> right? I mean, how many, on a given day, right? You're moving pretty well in the spirit and suddenly it's in the flesh. You're moving pretty good and being in the authority and everything and suddenly you're just down in the sorrow. It's kind of a way that we all are. And part of the issue is this, do you have got giants in your land? How many of you got giants you're dealing with? Okay. Yeah. You know what? Because frankly, whenever there is a promise of God, and I won't give you the re reference out of Judges, but it says that God left the enemy in the land so that the children, the next generation, would learn how to war. And you know, your salvation was incredibly passive, correct? You did nada, right? You sat there, you struggled, you fought against it. But he said, nah, you're mine. <laughs> And he brought you into the kingdom. But now there's this part of sanctification where he's going, okay, now I need you to walk this out. I broke you out of Egypt, Israel. I wandered you around. I showed you how all this works. Now I need to set you into the promise, but you need to take it, right? And so there's always a giant wherever there's a promise. How many of you have a promise that hasn't been fulfilled yet? Oh, wow. For those of you who don't have a promise that's been fulfilled. I saw that your hands did not go up. We need to talk. Uh, it's been estimated that in Scripture there's about 8,000 promises, plus or minus. Okay. So if you got all of them, it's great. Uh, we'll just take you out back and we'll watch you walk on the water on the pool. <laughs> don't worry. If you don't make it, we'll just hold you down. 
Got to die again. Okay. So, scenario we're going to have is looking into Samuel, 1 Samuel. And the reason that we're there is two members of the tribe of Benjamin I mentioned, right, were King Saul and Jonathan. And so I've been spending time because of that looking at them and going, okay, God, what is it in this time you want me to see? But we're in a year that is linked to David. And David becomes a tipping point for a lot of people, just like the son of David is a tipping point for a lot of people. It's a, he is a decisive. Jesus said, I haven't come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. You know, we, we, we just don't like that sometimes, but it's just the reality. David often would do that too, and people would have to decide how they're going to align. But before things got totally crazy, there was an issue with a major giant of the Philistines, right? By the name of Goliath, right? Yeah. And so he was down making all sorts of grief, and he was prophesying every morning and night over the troops of Israel. Basically going, <laughs> yeah, if you're so good, then come on out. All it takes is one man, and nobody was willing to stand forward and deal with a nine-foot man with a spear, whose spearhead weighed, I think it was 25 pounds, and his coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. It was a major, major warrior. And, of course, you know the story, because David shows up, and he hears this guy blowing hard, and it just ticks him off. And so he starts going, so what's going to be done for the man who'll take this guy down? I love David. He's a warrior poet, okay? By the way, when we do worship, sometimes people go, well, how can you do all I want is you? And it goes from this incredibly soft thing to this incredibly warfare thing and then back again. I'm sorry, that's who what God has set in me. I have that same uh, wiring. The, it's called the mercy wiring that David had, and it's the warrior, okay, and it's the worshiper. And so you just have both. It's just what it is, and you move in both because God does. Hello? You think they're just all around heaven singing kumbaya? It ain't happening, okay. So anyway, so word gets back to King Saul that David said he's going to do something. And so he brings him over and he says, okay, kid, you're, you're a kid. And he's been a warrior since he was a kid. There's just no way. And David says, look, I have taken care of bigger, badder, and I'm going to take care of him. So Saul then goes into this. So Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail David fastened his sword to the, his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. I'm going to keep going here, okay? One set of armor, right? Number two. This is a chapter later after David has defeated Goliath. Now, when he, David, had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Okay? Two sets of armor. And, you know, God... God just does things while he moved me into stuff, and when I'm studying, he'll show me things. I thought, I've never, ever seen this before. There's actually a third set we're going to get to later, but let me just connect in some dots. What does Saul's armor consist of? And by armor, if you saw this, and you see this in the second, when you gave this in covenant, particularly, it was about taking on an identity, taking on a level of authority, but you're also now encumbered in some way by that, right? So what have you got, and what are you wearing, and how well are you moving in it? Here's the stuff that fed into Saul's armor. Let's just look at some snippets of his story about him in 1 Sam 10. This is when he's supposed to be anointed king, and they can't find him. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, there he is, hidden among the equipment, hanging out with the baggage, right? Okay. A little bit of, hmm, okay, maybe he's not quite ready. Later on, when he... <laughs> gets impatient and sacrifices to the Lord, not waiting for Samuel. 
He says this, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Later on, a few episodes, a few chapters later, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Are you getting a pattern here? When Saul and all Israel heard these words, the words of the Philistine, they were greatly dismayed and afraid. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. So I just want to give you the things that are basically what I consider Saul's armor, and it's this way. It's based first in fear. Okay? Time and time again, there's a lot of fear there. It's also based in high practicality, just so we're clear. Now, practicality is not a problem if it's rightly submitted to the Lord. What do you mean you want us to feed these guys? We can't, 300 denarii, 300 days wages wouldn't feed them. Or even a snack, what do you got? Well, we got five loaves and two fish. Practicality, right? That's what we got. Just, well, send them home. Okay. So you look at it. Saul had this highly practical sense about him but it got in the way of faith. And then he moves into religion because of that. When I saw that you didn't show up and the people were fleeing, I felt compelled to do this. In other words, I may not be in a relationship with God because it's really sketchy, but I, I know I got to do certain things in order to get his favor. So I had to do this. Hello? And lastly, he's, he's big into safety, frankly. <laughs> he stayed back there. He should have been the champion to go down to face Goliath, right? Instead, he's got to have a kid that's like half his size, right? Paul was a whole head higher than anybody in the kingdom, it says. So, just a quick check on here, right? How often are we putting on armor that's based in fear? Highly practical and pragmatic. Sometimes a little bit too religious. Oh, I need to do this or... Hello? We can't be moving forward in that. David's very clear, I, I can't move in this stuff. <laughs> and frankly, if he'd gone out in that armor, I'm not sure what would have happened. Just so we're clear, what we're talking about and sometimes what we so often put on is not our true armor, correct? Okay. So let's just look briefly at John's armor because I thought it's just kind of intriguing to look at the difference here. Let me just give you some snippets in the story about Jonathan. Then Jonathan said to his armor bearer, this is way before, right, when things are just kind of at a stalemate before Goliath, before all of that. Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Wow. Statement of faith? Real clear. You are aware that at this point in time, the only two people that had swords were Jonathan and his dad, Saul. Nobody else. And they're going to go up to an armed garrison. you, you got to like this guy, right? Okay. Here's another snippet. Once they go up and they're waiting for the signal, if they ask us to come up or, you know, one thing, if they say, come, we'll come down to you, then it's a different thing. They gave the right answer, and so Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. It's very interesting. He goes with uncircumcised, so immediately he puts it into a category of uncircumcised is outside of the covenant and outside of the promise. You have to get this. In other words, squatters on land that they don't have a right to. Okay? And not only that, but when he goes up, look what he says, the Lord has delivered them. He's prophesying in the future. Already done. What do you mean he's delivered them? They're standing up there. We're down here. There's like 20 of them. There's two of us. But he gets it into the hand of Israel, right? Into the nation. It's not just a personal thing. Hello. So, of course, you know, so much happens now between Jonathan and his dad over David. Really becomes a division thing there. At one point, Jonathan's talking to David, says, my father has troubled the land. Actually, this is not to David. This is after when Jonathan and his, his armor bearer go up and they, they kick butt on the garrison and suddenly all hell breaks loose, right? They're trying to figure out what to do, what to do. And so the battle gets enlarged back with Saul. He wants to do a thing again about 
you know, checking with the Lord. But then when it gets too hot and fast, he says, no, nah, don't bother. We're going anyway. Hello. No relationship there. But Jonathan, when he's going, has some of the honey. He doesn't know it's been forbidden. My father has troubled the land. Interesting statement. Yes, indeed, he does trouble the land. Look now how the continents, my continents is brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely. He is the true leader. Talking about David, Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. Later on, when they're having, David's having to flee, and he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father knows that. I'm just, that's quite an amazing statement, right? In the face of the threat of power, there is an understanding of the anointing there. Jonathan, just to me, is huge in faith. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. So Jonathan's armor has to do with faith. It has to do with deep relationship. It has to do with love. He loved him like his own soul. And it has to do with risk. And all of that gets wrapped up into a covenant, cutting covenant that says, your enemies are now my enemies, even if that's my own father. You get this, right? I'm speaking kind of quickly on this. Yeah? Okay. What about David, just who David was, and kind of the armor that I think David wore even going into that battle, right? With nothing but a sling and five smooth stones. Let's go back. And David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Right? Do you see how he's recasting the conflict? David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. <laughs> then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Are you hearing the armor that he's got? It's all covenant-based, folks. It's based on the fact that God promised this. You are uncircumcised. You have defied the armies of the, little, of the living God. He's really clear about whose enemy Goliath is. He is very clear. It's God's enemy. See, sometimes we just don't get that calibrated in the giant that we're facing. You do not get that your promise and that giant standing between you and the promise is not simply your enemy. Hello. And we tend to fight and pray and act like it. David's very clear. He speaks historically. He speaks out loud. The same God who did this and this for me is going to do this. Hello? That's part of his armor. It's a rehearsing of the faithfulness of God. Years ago, we were talking about, I was talking with Kim about the fact that David, you know, back in his tent, had, had the bear skin and the lion skin. You know, we have to be able to look back in our tents and go, okay, what have I got? Where's the faithfulness? And Kim said, well, I don't have a bear skin, but I got a few squirrels. Okay. You know, in other words, what, what, whatever they are, everybody's got a victory on this, right? You have to go back and rehearse it so that you're, you're making a continuity between what was and what's about to be so that you can be in the center of it at peace. He speaks history, and then he speaks prophetically. This day, God's going to do this. I don't care you're trying to prophesy over me. I'm not going to receive that, right? Right? Because Goliath says, oh, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks and stones? Today I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds. David's like, ah. 
And he's very clear about whose battle it is. It's not only whose enemy, but it's whose battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. And he also knows how it's won, because the Lord does not save with sword and spear, but he's going to do it his own way. Is this making some sense? Okay. So, let's just bring it home a little bit. Fear-based armor. Religiousness and legalism can be the armor. Oh, I mean, I haven't, you know. Now, let, let's just be clear. We, you need and rightly honor God, and there's things you need to do to do that. If you're so uptight that if you don't write this tithe check and get it dropped in in time, that it's going to, you don't understand the relationship with God, okay? You're getting a little too legalistic there. Now, there's times out of the relationship God's going to say, look, I need you to do this because you need to reorient who you are and what's important, okay? That's a very different matter. But I've seen people just frantic about, I got to get to, it's like, calm down. God knows your heart in this. Now, if he told you you need to go and drop it up, great, okay. But okay, don't, don't, you understand? Don't go there. Well, but, but I didn't pray this today. Uh, careful that you're where you're that on that, okay? Are there things you need to do? Yes, be wise, be discerning, stay in timing with the Lord. But be careful, you're not putting on an armor of religion, folks. You know, if I don't do that, then dot, 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 dot. And bottom line, that gets a lot of times works-based, not relational and covenant-based. Just a reminder, right? He numbered your days before you were ever created. He's got you. Other kind of armor that we often pull up is really a form of self-protection. Okay. Oftentimes, we will withdraw from situations, okay? It can be physical. We're going to stay out of harm's way. It can be spiritual, emotional. I'm going to keep my heart and my spirit back removed. Do you, you, anybody ever do that? Okay. Now, there's wisdom and discernment. There's times, but sometimes that's our way of armoring up. It's not really armoring up with anything of God. It's fear-based again, folks. Okay. We get highly practical about that, like Saul did, okay? And we let that over, okay, no, no. You are my counselor, my comfort, my strength, and my guide. You are in me. You are with me. You are for me. I can step into this. I don't have to be in fear. Hello? Yeah? You guys are all a little quiet tonight, so I guess trying to make sure you're still actually awake, so, okay. By the way, um, self-protection, the armor can be in the opposite way from withdrawal and passivity. It can be aggressiveness. Sometimes you run into people like that. They have got an answer and a quick scripture for everything. Oh, you know what? I, I know what you need to do. Hello. You know, after a while, they walk in the door and you try to go, hello, okay. How are you doing? Fine. Because you don't want to open up about anything because next thing you know, okay, Oh, well, you got to da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, right? And a lot of times, that's an armor put up there. That is opposing. That is a, I need to be this way. I've got a plan. I've got a way out for any occasion. So we can do that also inside, okay? I was raised. No, I wasn't raised. I became this way out of the upbringing because it felt so unsafe because my dad was a workaholic and just, there wasn't much of him left when he got home. And my mom, we just were never sure she was going to survive another holiday. And so because of that, I just had to kind of watch and, and figure out. And so I got very good at figuring out and always having a plan. I never, never was a Boy Scout in the natural, but I was in the spirit and the emotion. Always be prepared. Yeah. So I kept. I kept an eye, look, I could read everybody coming in the room. Okay, that person, I got to, you know, and I knew how to become enough of a chameleon. Okay, that was my armor, my posing. Had nothing to do with faith. And I could put up a pretty good Christian veneer and all that. Oh, yes. No? Anyway, am I singing anybody's song in here? Okay, okay. Denial and passivity sometimes is an armor. Oh, you know what? I just, I just don't. 
you know, the new expression is, uh, whatever. The old expression was, okay, sarah, sarah, whatever will be, will be, okay? That's an armor from uh, just trying to pull enough away from it. Again, it's fear-based because we're, we're afraid if we engage it and it doesn't work right, then it's just like, okay, whatever. Denial and passivity. Um, and by the way, intellectualism and rationalization can come this way. Oh, it's a very interesting thing. Oh, no, 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 no. And we, rather than being exposed, we come up with a whole lot of thinking process through it. No, anybody here? Okay. Part of those of you who have a keen mind, okay, that's part of the problem. Sometimes for some of the, that's, that's real hard for you to receive some of the gifts of the Spirit because they're mystical, they're mysterious, and the brain can't quite process it. And that feels a little dangerous and out of control. So, okay. Okay, so you know this verse, these verses, but I'm going to read them to you in the Passion Translation, which is really a paraphrase, but I love it. Now, my beloved ones, I've saved these most important truths for the last you supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat, I love that part, is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides, so you're protected as you confront the slanderer, for you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. Wow. Huh? Okay. The old verse that you're used to is what? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yeah. This is a paraphrasing of it. But so once upon a time, there were soldiers who got tired of putting on all the gear. It took hours. And you know, that body armor just makes me sweat and it chafes my neck, said one. And that Kevlar helmet, man, it crushes my hair. I get a headache from it. It's just a drag, you know, and these boots. I mean, who, these boots, you know, they smell still from boot camp. And I'm just tired of them. I, I like the flip-flops. Uh, I like my shorts. I like my T-shirt. I don't want that other stuff. And, you know, carrying that M16 just wears me out. I mean, I rarely fire it. And so off they went, and one by one by one, they were taken out. See, we, we just don't comprehend that we're in a war zone. John Eldridge says, the problem in most churches is that telling them to put on the full armor of God feels like telling them to show up in full hockey gear on a Sunday morning service. They're like, Why? Now, once upon a time, there was another group of soldiers that felt that would be fine to go and put all that. But you know what? It's so much better in the barracks where we get to hang out and sing songs about how great everything is to be together. And let's just not go out there. Then we don't need to put on the armor. But after a while, it wasn't the enemy that came and got him. It was God. He just blew the whole thing up. Acts, stoning of Stephen, okay? They, they weren't complacent, but God had to, had to put, them, put them in flight, right? So they went out. So then, put on truth as a belt to strengthen you to stand. Put on holiness as the protective armor that covers your heart. Stand on your feet alert, then you will always be ready to share the blessings of peace. In every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, for it's able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. 
and take the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. Pray passionately in the spirit as you constantly intercede with every form of prayer at all times. Pray the blessings of God upon all his believers. Powerful translation, huh? So, question is, what armor are you wearing, and are you armoring up with his armor? Um, my responsibilities here are predicated on the fact that I am staring, staying very clear and clean and in deep heart relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Otherwise, I could do all that other stuff, and it would, wouldn't matter squat. All it would do would cause problems because I'd be speaking in unlived truth. Okay? One of the things that kind of amazed me in Acts when there's a problem with the serving of the, the widows and so forth, that the, the disciple says, it's not right for us to give up the ministry of the word and prayer in order to serve tables. I think the first time I read that, well, that's pretty cocky. She's supposed to be the servant of all people, you know? Be a, Jesus took it off, you know, put a towel around his waist. and. But no, I, I now get, they understood. There was, this was the first thing. So for me, my time in the morning with the Lord and, and making sure that, that I'm connected and the relationship is there, I'm aligned afresh in covenant. And so... I could take you through all of that, but it's um, what I want to just jump into is simply this, the belt of truth. It's the first piece of armor, okay? And there's a reason that it's first. And years ago, I would just go through quickly and armor up. I said, Lord, I put on the, br the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, my feet shod, okay? And I would do little gestures, and that was... That was okay. It was at least a starting point, but there was no real connection. It's like growing up where you pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday and whatever in church, right? You get to a point where you're praying it, and you just don't even think about any of the words. Anybody here? Okay. No, you're all saints, so you're all fine. Anyway, a belt has two sides to it. It has an inside and an outside, and I've gone into this some before, but I, that just kind of struck me as sort of interesting. Bottom line, the inside is so much in the belt of truth about who he is, and the outside is who I am and reflecting. And who I am cannot be disconnected from who he is, okay? But it's what faces me that really gives all the support. Out there, there's some more things on it. So I'm just going to give you part of what I pray with the armor about the belt of truth. And don't try to take these notes. I'll try to put them in the, in the follow-up. And I could just pray this out, but I'll take it line by line. I put on the belt of truth, the truth that it is all about you and it's not about me. You are the beginning and end of this story, and you're all up and in this messy middle. You are all up and in my business because my life is not my own. I was bought with a price. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And by that cross, I am dead to the world all its temptations, distractions, delusions, and timelines. And any way those perk up and through the body of Christ. And all those things are dead to me. This is the first half of my dealing with the truth. But see, I am praying this. I say, Father, I'm putting on your armor, and then I'm saying these things out. I am prophesying. I'm speaking truth. All of these are biblically based, correct? Are all of these true for you? Okay, so take this as a, as a starting point. Completely write your own. I don't care. Or use this. I, we just gave this out to the guys in the prison. As I said, now there's a part two to this. But I said, I just, just so you can begin to start to do this, because that truth is what has to anchor you. Okay? And I'm not just making these declarations out. I'm saying these to Father. You're the hero of the story. I belong to you. My life is not my own. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Okay? And by the cross, I am dead to this stuff. 
Okay. Paul said, I'm dead to the world, but I had to go, you know what? And I'm dead to all that crap coming up through the church too. Cause trust me, it comes through in all sorts of perverted, weird ways. Yeah. Okay. So that's part of it. But then I, I take kind of this pivot here and I go into this and the belt of truth that I am your true son. I am blood bought because you chose me. Not only you, you not only love me, you enjoy me for who I am, even in all my faults and my failings. We enjoy each other's company, and we will do so increasingly forever. This has just become a new thing. You have to get this. I enjoy his company. But guess what? He enjoys mine. You, you have to. This is, this is key, folks. If you're not there yet, you need to get there. Okay. Earlier on, when I'm talking about, Lord, I thank you that when you look at me, you see the blood of Jesus. You have forgiven me my sin, exchanged my life for his and his for mine, granted me his righteousness, and made me complete, lacking nothing for life and godliness. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm declaring thanks, but I'm reaffirming all these things he's done. You have to get, by the time I'm done with all this, man, I'm, I'm in heaven. Okay. No matter where I started, okay. Hello. <laughs> you have to you have to find, but you got to get into the delight. And the fact is, is that I'm convinced now that and I make this statement that and I usually say, and every single day we enjoy each other more and more, and we'll do so forever beyond when there even aren't any more days. Do you get that he enjoys you? See, I'm, I'm not going to jump off that. You have to, the belt of truth, this armor, you have got to get that sense. I think David had that sense. I am, and well, lo and behold, why? Okay. For I am, we, for I am your inheritance. Say, I'm his inheritance. I am. See, that's, that's so cool. And you are mine. Okay. Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made in your image, and you have set a fragment of your glory in me. Get this right here. That is unique in all the earth and unique in all of time. See? Yeah. Mm. You just have to get that you're a rarity. There is no one else in 8 billion people on the earth that has this fragment of glory that Juan has. I don't care that I want what Juan has. I can't have it. Juan's got it. Nobody else is getting it, ever. And that's why there's this whole sense of God's delight, increasing delight day after day with Juan, because his image is in Juan, and that fragment of glory is unique. And God wants it to shine. Because he knows as that happens, Juan just becomes more and more alive. See, do you understand? If you get this belt of truth in place, there, all the other pieces are important too, but this is a starting point because it orients you toward God's heart towards you and his towards you. His towards you and you to, yours towards his. You know what I'm saying. Okay, no, never mind. <laughs> Whack! That glory is being revealed more and more as I walk with you. For you are for me and not against me flavor of this, okay? Now, I'm going to show you some more of the things, well, just a little bit, but you have to get this, this pivots now to specific ways in which he has formed me. And am I there yet? No, but it's part of it. So part of this is you form me as a man of God and a man after your heart. I am a warrior poet and a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And you have also formed me, and I'll just give you some of the things verbally, as an excellent communicator, a writer, an author, an artist, an athlete, a passionate and devoted husband, a faithful and loyal brother and friend in Christ Jesus. You have formed in me the heart of the Father, that I would be a fierce and faithful father to Levi and to many others in the body of Christ. See, you need to write what your own thing is that's there, but you've got to get some pieces there, because that is truth. Those are things in me that he has set and revealed, and I'm walking out. Does this make some sense? You understand how just going to the belt of truth, this is a little bit more involved, but when you're saying it to the Father, and he's hearing it, you think he's, he's going like, oh, just hurry up, kid. Shut up. You're bugging me. He's going, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. Let's connect. 
Yeah, yeah, that's who you are. Hello? And I do this, I don't get as expansive with everyone, but, but the breastplate of righteousness, that is about holiness and walking in that and what it protects and your feet shod. And when I get to the shield of faith, folks, it, it sounds kind of like this, and I take up the shield of faith, the ongoing decision to believe you, trust, walk, hear, and obey you in all things at all times in all ways. And by this shield, I quench every flaming arrow of the evil one. You understand, rather than just the shield of, what is that? It's an ongoing decision to believe, to trust, to walk with, to hear and obey. Hello? I don't understand why I'm getting so attacked. I've got this shield of faith. Yeah, but you're not trusting God. <laughs> and you're not obeying what he's told you to do. What do you, anyway, yeah? Each part, the helmet of salvation, I expand that because it's, it's protecting my eyes and my ears, everything that I see and hear and perceive and discern, my thoughts, because it's right here. And it's sozo, it's the salvation, the helmet of salvation. Okay, so I'm just, I'm teasing you out with some other stuff, but you'll get the best of truth, right? Okay. Here's what's interesting. There's a third set of armor in all of these texts, and it's this one. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. David took the head of the Philistine, that would be Goliath, and brought it to Jerusalem. Don't you love that? Okay, who wants to see it? Warrior poet, let me tell you. But he put his armor in his tent. Very interesting. Third set, there's Saul's fear, Jonathan's covenant, but then there was the armor of his enemy. So here's a question. What weapons of the enemy have you taken as spoils? Okay. So you have to get that the very thing that the enemy wanted to do to destroy David became the sword by which David cut his own head off. Hello. Remind yourself of God's faithfulness. You hanging in here okay? Okay, let me wrap up. So, so what? Two armors, and, and it's an ongoing decision. David refused Saul's armor. You have to first refuse the pure practical, religious, fear-based, stay safe kind of stuff. The withdrawal stuff, the intellectual stuff, all that kind of stuff. You have to just go, I'm not going to walk in that. That is not the armor that I need. Okay? It will never fit. But he took up John's, which was relational and love. It was covenant. It had a new identity in there. There's so much more I could cover in that. We just can't do it right now. And then he moved in freedom, and then he declared... All is covenant-based. You uncircumcised Philistine, you one that's outside of God's promise, you are trespassing on the promise of God, and you are in my way. Hello? Does that recalibrate your brain on the giant you're facing? He knew whose enemy it was and whose battle. He spoke history out loud. God, you've been faithful in this. I watched you do this. I watched you do that. We were talking with this with the guys and in, the inmates inside. He said, have all of you had God come through for you in some amazing ways? I said, yeah. You need to rehearse that and remember that so that you can go forward and say, and he did it then, and he's going to do it again. And he prophesized the outcome. He prophesized the outcome. God's going to give you into my hand today. And then this, I love it, he ran to meet the enemy. He didn't sit there and wait. He went after him. Why? Because of all this, he knew, right? You get fully armored up, folks. You have a confidence. I can tell you, I trained for many, many years in martial arts. And it was interesting because when you got a chance to put on your full gear for sparring, it, it gave you a little bit more swagger because <laughs> you could take a harder shot and be okay. It's just something. I, how many of you played? Some of you played football. Christy, particularly linebacker, right? No, okay, never mind. No, no, but there's a thing about when you put on the equipment, you feel a little bit kind of like, okay. You watch it on the sideline before a football game, and the guys are kind of, and they're hitting each other. There's kind of a thing of smacking around and, you know, getting it there. Okay, so bottom line, a few other things here. Have I given you enough? You got it? Okay. Just this, all too often we put on some armor that is related to fear, practicality, etc. Stop that. All it's going to do is make you vulnerable. 
It's no armor at all. It's actually an invitation to the enemy. Hit me here. It's like putting a sign. Remember putting those signs on somebody's back? Kick me? Okay. There are habits. There's things that are worked before. There are distractions, numbing things. Armor cannot be made of fear alloys. And there are many. It has instead to be relational, love, and covenant-based. Folks, covenant. Say covenant. covenant. God, you, you, I didn't choose, choose you. You chose me. You're my God. You have promised all these things to me. It's in your covenant. Okay, here we go. Stop begging. You ask in confidence. You don't beg. You're a delight to him, even when you're so screwed up. I mean, goodness, if he can love Gail, he can love anybody. You know, come on. That's the one that died, Abigail. Abigail's a lad, that's right. You cannot, so you can't have an armor that's made of fear alloys, nor can you put on a covenant armor out of fear. If I don't do this, I'm going to get my butt kicked. That's not gonna that's not gonna work. Even it might be true. I'm putting this on because this is covenant armor, and I need to do this having done all then to stand. And the perspective, too often we see our giants simply as our own mess. And God's like, Why are you not accessing all the resources I give you? Covenant means that my enemies become God's and God's become mine. Get clear about this. That giant is a squatter on your promise. We do not understand, fully understand covenant. David's refusal of Saul's armor freed him up to wear the covenant of arm, of the armor of covenant. If you're in the fear, you can't, you have to push that off. Just make a decision. I'm not wearing that garbage. I'm not going to be that defensive way. I'm not going to withdraw. I'm not going to do all these. I'm not going to play those games. I'm going to stand firm in the true armor. You have to consciously refuse one to wear the other. Ultimately, it's his fight, it's his giant, it's his enemy standing between me and the fullness of the covenant, covenant promise he made to me and this last line. Therefore, it cannot and will not stand. Graphic make a little more sense now? Folks, we're in a dangerous time. It's going to get increasingly so. And if you are not, this is not legalism. This is not religion. You have got to get better. Do not be like that soldier in the barracks going, you know, I'm just, I, I, I don't understand. Why do I really need it? Years ago, American Express made this great ad. Don't leave home without it. Why? Because you'll be exposed. Frankly, right now, the only, th reason, the only thing we won't leave home without typically is our phone. You know what? If you have to get up earlier, folks, I, early, I had to learn to be, quote, a morning, morning person because I needed to get the time to be fully integrated to Father, Son, and Spirit and armored up before I walked into what I was facing. I just had to discipline myself. I had to go to bed earlier, so I got up earlier. You know what, though? The discipline shifts when you suddenly want to do that. I mean, it got to a point that my office is upstairs. I would go bounding up the stairs. Father, oh, and Penny's got something on this. What do you want? Do you know you're going to do? Okay. Father, thank you for... Um, Man, how long have you got? Lord, I thank you for what you've taught me about armor over the years. Thank you that you've given me language and that we talk about this every day and that uh, you do enjoy me, even though I'm so screwed up in so many ways. And I love that about you. 
makes me want to be with you even more. Lord, I just impart that now. I impart an anointing that every person here will grasp that they are liked by you, enjoyed by you. That the belt of truth is so powerful for who they are, who you are in them. Make it vibrant, Lord. I seal this work so it can't be stolen. Enemy can't trample it down, snatch it, choke it out. In the name of Jesus. So, I'm going to have... the sense this is a man of God, and I need to rightly honor him. And he does some um, amazing work really rescuing young lives, literally at times, from, from death, and then um, bringing them up in a way that they should go. Um, and so it's always good to see him. It's been a little while since we got him back, and, and we have been able to partner with him in some ways, um, financially and, uh, and prayerfully, but... Uh, Anyway, Pastor, it's just a blessing to have you here. Come on up. This going to be okay? Hello. Good to see you again. Uh, I I used to be a stranger, but now I'm not a stranger. I'm in a family of God, the children of God. I'm here because God wanted me to be here. Um, I thank God the someone that has just come on. It's a blessing to me. And when I was seated there, the voice was very clear. God was saying, I'm raising my warriors. And no demon can stand against them. Mm -hmm. This place wasn't like this when I was here. But it's coming up. God is doing great things. I'm so humbled and I'm so happy to see many of you. May the Lord bless you. I'm with Pastor Gordon. Reverend Gordon is my host. Everything in my life is a miracle. Even coming here was purely a miracle. I remember the last time I was here, there was COVID, and I got stuck. I never went home the way I was supposed to be. But again, my going home was a miracle. So everything has been a miracle, a miracle, a miracle. Up to this moment, I'm living in miracles of God. Now, the first day I came here, I followed up this preaching, and when I went home, it's very interesting that this technology is so good, that after the sermon has been preached, when, it, when he posts it, it pops on my phone, and I can follow everything as if I'm here with you. So I'm so grateful, and um, like the first time I came here, I came to give my story. But today, I have come to give my testimony of what God is doing. So my name is Boniface Simani. I'm with the Bread of Life Church, Eldorate, Kenya, where the Lord has called me to serve. And 
he called me many years ago, and I don't want to go into that story, but I just want to give you the testimony of what God has been doing. So this is the church I serve. Um, I come from Kenya, so I have tried to make it very short so that if you look at Africa, this is Africa, and then Kenya is on that side right there, and then that is my country, and Eldoret is somewhere right there. Some information on top of that, which I believe you can be able to read. And that is my family. That is me. That is my wife, Nancy, Jason, Sammy, and Rose. And you can see they have grown. Mm -hmm. These children have a long story to tell. I know you know it. And that is my son, Sammy, the first day we picked him from the children's home. For those of you who know the story, he was thrown out to be killed by animals, the wild dogs. But God never allowed it to happen. They wanted him to die out of uh, coldness and out of wild dogs. But God never allowed it. So when we went to pick him as a, as, as a way of adopting a child, we were given a file. And that file had all the information that I'm telling you about that little boy. He has been growing. He went to, that was his first day to school. And finally, God gave us these wonderful children. Uh, my girl, Rose, is 14 years old. You can see from that picture, she has really grown. And this girl has another story. She's my elder brother's sis, uh, daughter. My elder brother was found dead in the house. And nobody knows what happened. So we never went into it to follow, but he had three girls, three daughters. So I had to pick one of the daughters, that is Rose. My mother took the other daughter, and my younger brother took the other one so that at least we can raise them up. So I became a father of Rose, and I became a father of Sami. And I became a father of that, uh, sorry, I became a father of this little one. So this is a baby that God gave us after 17 years of waiting upon the Lord. After adoption, after getting my brother's daughter, God says, Bonface and Nancy, he is your own. Receive. So God gave us this baby, and this is the day he was born. And that is the day I was having him in my arms and the mama. And you can see how he's growing. He's growing, and he just graduated from kindergarten the other day. <laughs> so he's right there. And uh, this is the ministry we do. That is the church we used to have. It was a very old church, but those members were not old. I don't mean old. I just mean uh, the building was worn out, but the members were not worn out. Their spirits were strong and healthy. So that was our church, and this is what we do. We bring these children. We help them. God called me to serve children in the communities, in the slum of Huruma, Eldoret. <coughs> And what we do is we, I went out to preach, and when I was preaching, I realized these children were just wandering. They had no hope. They had no place to go. So I brought them to the church and asked them, why are you not going to school? And they said they have no money to pay the school fees. So I had to pick them, and uh, we stayed with them. But finally, I started, we started having a, a program in the school, in the church compound, where we were teaching them right from there. And when my wife Nancy heard about it, she had to leave her job and join me to give education to these children because she's a trained teacher. So what happened is, uh, um, in 2006, the government was very keen to ask us, how are we having children without paperwork? So we had to make it very formal and have the paperwork so that we do not have children, as you know, the issue of child trafficking. So we were allowed to have the center of a school 
and we bring in these children and the only thing that god put in my heart is to bring hope into the lives of these children you're going to see what god has done in their lives so that church that you saw the one that was right there that one at the top when that church was just about to fall down i remember asking and i was not shy i said please help us to build this church we are praying that we need a, a decent church where we can fellowship and by the grace of god this ministry this church here supported us ah uh, sorry let me go back so this church out of that they supported us to have this church and is built so out of your love out of your support prayers and finances this church is there to serve the 143 for 187 children we have and to also serve the community that God has called me to serve so that's why i was telling you i'm not giving you my story today i'm giving you my testimony Amen. praise god so the next is um the story about how comido was started and what happened now this is the just a short story of how comido started and you can see and finally down there it says with about 32 dollars a month you are able to support a child to get two meals a day and education for the whole one month with 32 dollars you are able to support a child in this school have education have meals and be able to continue with their life just from that ground that you have seen i want you to see the next pictures and you can see that is the background that is where these kids come from you can see that those are children that have no father and mother in the house they are left alone the elder one with the white shirt is the one taking care of the siblings and they have to go looking for food from the trash so that they can feed and these are the children we bring and when we bring them to school you can see we feed them and when we feed them we give them education the next is you are seeing great things that god is doing why i say testimony is because um this little girl here was on the street the one here and her mother is right on that side she cooks donuts for her to survive and those donuts are not enough to feed her family and to educate this child but through your support this child has this girl was able to go through comido school from the grade 1 to grade 8 she finished she passed with flying colors god helped her to go to high school so this is a uniform for the high school and this is the same mother that you can see there now taking her child together with me to senior i mean to uh, secondary school and this mama could not stop crying for what god has done for her child this girl this girl scored b plain uh in her fourth form exam and she is now in university oh, wow. So that's why I said um I'm actually talking about a testimony and then this is a very familiar face <laughs> that's a very familiar face that I believe you know uh Pastor Gordon or Reverend Gordon is my host and he came to our church he came to Kenya through the connection of God that I can't explain and when God brought him to Eldoret he came and spoke to our church that small congregation you see he came and spoke to that church i remember him removing his shoes and stepping in front and he said the glory of god was there 
and he spoke the word of God. After that, we went out for a small lunch, and I left. We left each other. He went to the the uh, the the guest room where he was spending the night, and after some few days, he came back, and I was not there. And I was told he was looking for me. So when I went to look for him, the connection became more stronger. And the time I said I was coming here, he was with open arms to say, welcome to my home. Just like Jesus says, welcome, my daughter and my son. That is how he welcomed me. And right now, I mean, I've, even right now I'm in his house. And um, he writes books. He has written this book here called Miracles Abound. And that book has more stories about me and more about other pastors and about how miracles take place. And I know, even right now here, God has a miracle for somebody. God has a miracle for you. And I walk, I, I live like, I, say, I always say like, I'm a walking miracle. Everything that I do is miracle. So um, he has been of great help to us. And anytime he gets money out of the book that he sells, he sends to us to help a child go to school. And that is about $18 for one book. So if you need a book, you can get in touch with him to get one. And that is somebody you know. I couldn't do without this photo here. Um, because this photo reminds me of the love I saw here the love of Jesus, I was received. And remember, I was a stranger. But I was received with the love of God. I, I had so many prayers here. And out of that, when I went back to my country, so many things have happened. So many miracles have taken place. So many children, God is touching them. And so many lives are being changed. And there's so much hope that we are giving. So I couldn't do it away without this. I mean, I could not do away without this picture. I had to have it there with me for you to know that Pastor Stephen and our dear mom, Pastor Kim, has been a blessing to us. And anything you give them to support us, 100% it gets to our hands. I want to thank you so much. Finally, we have a friend of ours who is in Dallas. And uh, he has this organization. And before I came here, this program was ongoing. And what he did, he came to our country, Kenya. He visited me. He wanted to see what we were doing. Because he used to send some donation and he wanted to know what was happening. So he came and he said, Boniface, I want to see what is happening in, in, in Eldoret, in Kenya. So he slept in our home and... There was smoke everywhere. And when he woke up in the morning, he told me, Boniface, is this where you live? I said, yes. He said, okay, allow me to be in a hotel for today. <laughs> because he saw with his own eyes the environment and the children. He could meet them when we were going to the church because we were just walking on foot. So he came back and started this organization and said, anybody willing to support can send their money to this organization, and he gets to us, and that's what God has been doing. And many times, sometimes when we don't have um, um, the money, and you get you get it to Pastor Stephen, sometimes he sends right to him, and he sends to us. So I want to thank you again for doing that. And finally, I need your prayers, and that is end. Mm -hmm.